Away for another Vaughan boundary. <laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffner. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Michael Vaughan, Phil Tufnell and me, Ben Wright, with you once again for our final episode of this series, reflecting on England's tour of India and where it leaves Brendan McCullum's side heading into the summer. After almost two years of positivity under the stewardship of Stokes and McCullum, fans are starting to question England's approach to test cricket and wondering whether changes need to be made to get this team to the next level. McCullum himself has admitted some deep thinking is needed ahead of the summer, and the three of us will be discussing exactly what and or who needs to change. We'll also be checking in with our man in India, Nick Holt, for one last time before he flies back to the UK to gauge the mood in the England camp. Morning, Mike. Morning, Phil. First up, Phil, you're going to Cheltenham today. Mike, you're going tomorrow. Yes. Uh, any tips? Well, um, it's, Go on, then. it's looking very wet. It's looking very wet out there, so yes. I think the best... It's, yeah, it's, wet. it's wet in Surrey, so I suspect it'll be wet in Gloucestershire. Yes, uh, it will be, so it's coming in from the west, so it's going to be raining all day. So my tip is to stay in the box, uh, going up there with William Hill, so looking forward to a great day. <laughs> Yeah, I must admit, Ben, I reckon I've been to Cheltenham 10, 10 years now, uh, and I reckon there's only been one year when I've seen a horse. <laughs> <laughs> so you will be staying so, in the box. I, I, I'm not the right person to ask for any tips. I just know that at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, I'll be having yeah, a Guinness. There you go, there you go. Looking <laughs> yeah. forward to it. Fair enough. Yeah, OK. Um, so we should talk about the cricket. Uh, another defeat for England uh, in the final test, so they've uh, lost the series 4-1 uh, and a thumping defeat at that, it has to be said. So Hyderabad feels like an awfully long time ago now, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's uh, it's not an easy place to tour um, and it's probably the hardest of them all. Um, England will look back at this this series and think, well, what could have been? Because they did have chances. They they were in a few of the games. Um Let's be honest, they've been blown away in two games. The last one in Dara Masala um, and that third one losing by 434. They're two hammerings. But the other three, I thought, they competed really well. And, you know, you kind of look back at that first game. It took a, and I think it's, it's got to be up there with probably the top 10 test innings of any England player in the history of the game. The, the 196 that Oli Pope scored in that first game, yeah. that got them over the line there. Tom Hartley did the job with the ball, but... Um, look, it's not an easy place to tour, but I do think over the last six weeks there's been a little bit of this this approach that England have gone with and this ultra aggressive, um, ultra positive, uh, the language that they use. It, it's I wouldn't say yeah. it's been exposed completely, but I, I think they've been found out in a way that they they will know now getting on the plane home that they can't just play this one style of cricket against the better teams. They're going to have to play smarter. I just look at Joe Root, and Joe Root's the perfect example. For the first three test matches, he played um, a Joe Root style that, yes, he's played it quite nice in the last two years, but it's not the Joe Root that we've been loving for 10 years. And in the last two games where he got a tremendous 100 in that fourth game and got an 80-odd in the second innings in Dara Masala, that's the Joe Root method. Just yeah, real quality yeah. test match batting, defending the good balls, rotating the strike, hitting the balls to the boundary when it's there to be hit. That's Joe Root at his best. And I think some of the other players, I'm not saying you you can all bat like Joe Root. It's near on impossible because he's an incredible player. But I do think some of those uh, younger players and um, some of the batters that will be coming into the team, they have to look at Joe Root and understand that at test level against the quality bowlers, you do need a defence. It's almost if, Phil, you're... You're probably with me. It's almost as if the word defence is not allowed to be used in this era because it's, it's it's deemed negative. You know, you're not allowed to say you're allowed to defend the ball or play a forward defensive or play defensively just for a short period. It's almost like it's been banned from the dressing room. Well, against the quality teams, you do need a defence. And I think Joe Root has, has shown the method and the way for this England team going forward that... Uh, some of these other players are going to need a defence to survive against the better players and the better yeah, bowlers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you've got to have a defence, Mike, to be, in, in, enable yourself to score runs, haven't you? You know what I mean? Uh, I know that, that that's mm. a knock of Ollie Pope. 
Well, as you say, it, it, it was an incredible, not it was an incredible test match. I mean, what was it? Two, nearly two hundred behind in India, and um, and and mm. you and you and you come out and win the test match. So, if you look at it, really, you know what I mean. It could have been, could have been five nil, really, couldn't it? But um, I think England will be taking some positives home with them for sure. Um, I think that uh, you know the two spin bowlers, from my point of view. Did fantastically well. Sorry, and three. Sorry, Ray and Ahmed as well. I think that he's grown a lot. Um, so there are some positives um, to be taken back from England. But but I make you right. You know what I mean. You've got to you, you've got to judge the situation, and I think that's just what they didn't quite do. You know, they got themselves really in all of the Test matches, perhaps even just the last one they didn't. But they got themselves into positions, as you said, where they could have put India under pressure, and they did put India under pressure. I think that they shocked India in that first test match and they had an opportunity to just, you know, really sort of like rattle and worry that Indian team. But uh, then you've got to take your hats off to India. They played it beautifully, didn't they, after that first test match? Um, I think Rohit Sharma came to the fore with his captaincy. I think that the spin bowlers and the batters also then sort of like decided, crikey O'Reilly, we are in a contest here, which is a great effort in a way for any touring team to put an, an Indian side under that sort of pressure. So, positives to take back from England. But at the end of the day, as you say, Mike, a few things just to tweak with Basball, I think. The, the, the one thing I'll say about Basball, I think um, the method is, is, in a way, is working against seam bowling. So, when they face the seams, I, I think, you know, if you look over the last two years when they face seam bowling, um, they've managed to dismantle some good seam attacks around the world. South Africa, New Zealand, Australia last summer. I thought they played the seamers pretty well in this series on, you know, let's be honest, quite good wickets to face seam bowling. Um, the method isn't working against spin. No. It just isn't working against spin. You go back to the Ashes, Nathan Lyon really only played in one game. You know, he didn't really bowl in that <laughs> test match at Lords when he went off uh, injured. Uh, he got five for in that second innings at uh, Edgebaston, which basically set up the victory uh, for the Australian side. And again, spin in uh, this series, yes, it's difficult uh, in India, but the method isn't working against spin. You know, I look at that, that Ollie Pope shot, you know, when he got stumped just before lunch. There, for me, is the story of the last two years that, you know, yes, you, yes, you, can, yes, you can be in your mindset looking to be aggressive, but you have to be smart. You, you're two minutes away yeah. from lunch. You can't be dancing down the wicket to a, a, a wrist spinner when you're not quite sure which way it's spinning. I mean, there's just been some shots in this series that has it exposed. And it's not the technical side. You know, the technical side of the bat and he's not involved when someone's dancing down the wicket. That's purely a mental aspect of, of, of your thought process. And also maybe a, a lack of um, belief in your own defence that you can play a forward defence to get yourself to lunch, to just to see out the three or four balls remaining. Um, so that would be a bit of a concern for me. But the Baz ballers, they have a massive issue facing spin, playing the way that they do. Um, you know, I look forward now in the summer, they'll be fine because it's English conditions. Pakistan away, I mean, Pakistan don't really have the world-class spinners. Um, you know, can they play this method in Australia in a year and a half time? I think they'll have more success scoring runs because I think it, be easier for them against the seam bowlers, but they will come up against Nathan Lyon, and he's a quality bowler in Australia. So I do think they've uh, they've got a lot to work on, in particular their mindset and their method playing spin. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on, Mike. Actually, um, especially on pitches. I think if they're flat pitches, you can look to dominate the spinner for sure. But on pitches that are well. They, they were holding, weren't they? They were turning. They're turning pitches. They weren't ragging like we all thought they were going to be. There was a, but there was quite a bit in it there for the spin bowler to work with. And I can always remember being told when I was a youngster bowling, you know, you know, keep the men up. Don't worry. Let him go for that one over the top. Let him go for that shot. Let him go for the release shot or the big shot for four or six because, you know, he, he won't be able to keep doing that. You know what I mean? And that's what has then happened to this England side a little bit. You know what I mean? As a spin bowler, you don't mind tossing one up in front of the old nose. You know what I mean? And a good shot over perhaps mid-off or whatever for four or six. But then you then as a spin bowler in your mind think to yourself, well, listen, 
I'm 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 going to play with you a little bit there, and then oh, next one, you know, what I mean, like that Crawley delivery off Cool Deep, you know what I mean? Beautiful bit of bowling. He's hit him through mid off a couple of times, hasn't he? And then the skill of the spin bowler on a turning pitch is then to play with that little bit slower, little bit quicker, draw him through to play that shot again, bowl through the gate. It's very difficult to keep doing that on a spinning pitch. I, I actually think, Phil, I mean, when you're watching them um, bat as bat against spin, I think they're quite easy. As a spinner, Phil, when you're watching them, I think they're quite easy to predict what they're going to do next. Yeah, exactly. Ashwin suggested as much, didn't he, a couple of times. He sort of, he suggested in the interview afterwards that he knew what shot the bat, the batters were going to play and, uh, and bowled the ball mm, accordingly. Yeah. Well, I, the, 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 you know, I look at Ben Duckett's two dismissals in, um, in the last Test match. And I was watching going, why are you suddenly trying to whack it down the ground? Not <laughs> I've not seen him dance down to whack it down the ground. He's a sweeper. You know, that's his strength. He plays square of the wicket shots. And you've got to give India a huge amount of credit because I think they blocked up a lot of the square of the wicket options for Ben Duckett. Yeah. So they, then he he had to go, oh, what's next? Where, whereas what he should have been thinking, right, you've blocked up my square of the wicket. I'll still play them. I'll keep playing them. But I'm not going to go to something that's not my strength, which... Yeah, let's be. I've not. I've not seen Ben Duckett whack one out the ground, down the ground, many times in his Test career. But I've seen him sweep and reverse sweep and get it fine, get it square, get it in front of square on both sides of the wicket. Um, that's what happens in India and, and on these big tours away from home when you're playing quality. It, it, it gets to your mind. <laughs> it really frazzles you. And by the end of that, um, you know, by the time England got to bat in the second innings, it was no surprise at all with me watching that you saw a few frazzled minds. Last uh, innings of the tour, they knew they'd lost the series. Uh, they knew they were going to lose 4-1. They were never going to come back. And that last innings was almost like, it just proves to you, it doesn't matter how much positivity you talk about in the last two years. It doesn't ma matter the messaging. You know, this England side have delivered a tour that's very similar to many England sides that have been to India. The last side lost 3-1. The side before that lost 4-0. Many teams go to India and it gets to you. And it doesn't matter how positive you are in the dressing room. Eventually... <laughs> You know, it just wears you down and you get frazzled. Uh, and that's what I saw in that last Test match, uh, a team that was uh, frazzled from the whole tour of uh, playing a very, very good team in their own backyard. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, there's been a lot of criticism uh, for England since, since the defeat on Saturday. Um, what we know about this this setup is that they'll, they'll shut that out. They won't listen to the criticism. Are you confident... Uh, that they'll be self-critical, that they will be introspective, they will have a have a look at the performance and they'll make changes. Well, I've I've heard a few interviews from uh, from Ben and a few of the guys afterwards, and I think they will. I think they've got to be. You know, uh, you know, some of the words coming back is that you know we're not stupid. We realise we've lost four one, and we're going to take this team forward, and it's going to be a learning process and everything. So. I think that they're not just, you know, right, that's the way we play and we're going to carry on. I think as a as a professional sportsman, you've got to criticise your own performance. I think, you know, you've got to look to get better and I'm sure they will. I'm sure that these guys are, are not just sitting on the plane with the cards and the beers out and just sort of saying, well, you know, we're just going to do this again. I think that, I think that, you're absolutely right, Mike. I think that, 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 that the way they go about playing spin has got to be slightly addressed. But... Um, yeah, I mean, you, you always have a bit of a debrief, don't you, with yourself more than anyone, Ben? You know, you sit there in a little quieter moment and you think to yourself, how can I have been a little bit better? You know, how can I have done this better? How can I have done that? So, you know, lots of people have been telling them this and I'm sure they will be looking at it. What do you reckon, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know what's uh, said um, in the dressing room. Um, the messaging's always very positive. I thought uh, Baz McCullum gave a... A really good interview. He, he openly admitted that the things weren't right. There was, uh, I guess, a few questions for uh, the team and also a few individuals within that team, which is absolutely right. The, the one concern I'll have is the bowling attack. I mean, I know the bowling actually been pretty good because the young spinners have been magnificent. But let's be honest, spin's not going to play a massive part in the next few months and particularly going forward to Australia. Um, it's those seam bowling combinations that concern me. And I used to look at the whole whole team. And in the last two years, you know, when you look at a real quality team, you, you kind of look at partnerships, both with the batting and the bowling. You kind of look down at a real quality team and you know there's a strong partnership or two when the bat, 
uh, a couple of batters get together. I, I don't see that with the England team. I, I guess the opening partnership, you could say, is the, the kind of uh, the standout at the minute. Those two at the top seem to have a great relationship. Um, you, you can't tell me that we've got a great combination in that middle where you kind of get two players together and you just know. You, I go back to Trot and Strauss or uh, Cook and Trot, you know, Pryor and Collingwood. These players, Peterson and Bell, I, I, I used to watch those players playing. just knew you were confident they were going to get a partnership developed. I don't see those combinations at the minute with the batting lineup, uh, and I don't see it at all with the bowling. I don't see a, a scene, but you know, Broad's now gone. Broad's gone. Jimmy Anderson's still going, and, and and Jimmy Anderson's 700 Test match wickets is an achievement in sport that I just don't think will ever be achieved again. That's how great it is, you know, for for yeah. someone to get 700 Test match wickets. I just can't see how uh, a bowler. <laughs> will ever get close to that. I mean, it's just remarkable what Jimmy's achieved. But to think at 41, he's still playing in this Test Match team. You look at Jimmy Anderson's 41, Mark Wood's 34, Ollie Robinson's 30. Where Where is this next combination of seam bills? In the next year or so, England are really going to have to work hard on giving the Gus Atkinsons, the Matthew Potts, Ollie Stones, if he can get fit. They're going to have to get some new combinations going because... You know, in a year and a half, you can't tell me that Jimmy's going to be running in in Australia in a year and a half's time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't put it past him. I mean, the guy's a phenomenon, isn't he? Yeah, he is a phenomenon. It can't be. It can't be that England need him in a year and a half's time, and and, and that's yeah. not disrespecting Jimmy Anderson. But if they are still needing Jimmy in a year and a half's time, there's a real problem with the bowling unit. Yeah. So England have yeah, to yeah. find some combinations that work both with the batting and with the bowling because. Uh, at the minute, it's very. If you look at England's victories, a lot of it's down to individual brilliance. It really is down to individual brilliance. It's not down to a collective team effort where you've got real good combinations working together. It's about individual brilliance, and it's very, very hard to get a consistent, great cricket team developed on individual brilliance. Yeah, I mean that's right. You know, you you, you look at it and you think to yourself. Um, they're, 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 they're a very together unit, aren't they? You know, they're all together, really got that going in the dressing room. They're all backing each other up or, up or anything. But when they actually then go out and play, they all bowl and bat, for, sort of, as you say, as individuals. I mean, the one thing that was mm. massively lacking in there with the bat was the partnerships, wasn't it? It was like those partnerships. There would be a great 70 from Crawley, but he would have had two or three guys with him along the way. There'd be a great knock from Duckett, but all these different guys were popping in and popping out. What you saw with India were big partnerships, and that's what kills you. That's what kills you in Test Match cricket, if you can get those big partnerships together. So uh, perhaps something to look at there as well. That, that, you, absolutely right there, Phil. I mean, this team, I don't think I've ever known a team that's been so together in terms of the messaging. I mean, you know, you look at all their Instagram posts after the series, all about love being in this team, love spending time with each other. It, it, it really is a, a a group that they've created that love each other's time. They play golf together all the time. Um, they've been up the hills in the Dharamsala, up the Himalayas. I've seen great pictures. You know, can, can they just take, a you know, just 50% of that onto the field? Because... Yes, they are a very tight team, but tight teams are tight on the field as well in terms of making sure that certain um, situations are dealt with as a team. You know, I keep yeah. going, I don't want to just throw Oli Pope under the bus, but if you're a real tight team, you don't dance down the wicket just before lunch. <laughs> you just no. don't do that. You get yourself lunch because the team needs you to be not out at lunch. The team yeah. actually don't yeah. need you to score another boundary in that last over. The team needs you not out at lunch, having a cup of tea, having a, a little bit of roti with your chicken and you go back out again. You know, that's teamwork and that's uh, being really tight as a team. Um, so they've got to try and take that off-field tightness and get it onto the onto the field. They're going to be absolutely fine this summer. They play Sri Lanka in the West in the six test matches. I'll be amazed yeah. if they don't win all six. I'll be yeah. staggered if they don't win all six because the depth of quality and at home with the Duke ball... You know, I, I just don't see England um, getting beaten in, uh, in in their own backyard this summer. Uh, and if they can get those six wins, and that's the goal that I will set them, and I'm sure it's the goal that the team will set themselves. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it all be rosy because they're not two quality sides, but they can get a little bit of what we're talking about into that system. It can't just be about swashbuckling cricket all summer. It can't be that they're just yeah. going out there and swing their arms again. We just want to see a bit of smartness. And I'm not saying going back to the old school in the attritional way, 
but somewhere in the in in between, somewhere in between. That's what we're looking for. So, so with those six uh, tests, uh, as you say, they're they're, they're probably favourites for those six tests. What would you, if you were in Ben Stokes's shoes, what would you be wanting to do with those six tests? Would you be wanting to try and get a settled side, or would you want to be trying uh, some new players, some new combinations, as you say, some new bowlers? Um, you know, see if people can take to the test arena. What would you do with that? Oh, I, I, well, let, let, let's be honest. Harry Brook comes in at number five, so Johnny Bairst is going to be struggling unless Johnny's uh, given the gloves again at number seven. So I, I, I think it'd be Crawley, Duckett, Pope, Roots, Harry Brook, Ben Stokes, number six. And then it, it's who's going to keep. You know, are they going to stick with Ben Folks? I get a feeling he might not be um, kept with. Um, so they might look for another wicket keeper bat. It could be an Ollie Robinson from Durham. Phil Salt's been mentioned briefly. Yeah. I'm not too sure that they need another style of uh, batter like Phil Salt in the Test Match team. I'd want a more steady player at number seven. I personally would stick with Ben Folks. I, I personally think he deserves a run in the side. Uh, and then it's about the bowling combination and they need to find some pace. They're not going to go to Australia in a year and a half and win with 80 mile an hour seam bowl. And they're just not. They need to find some pace. Wood, Ollie Stone, Joffre Arch. Can they get Joffre Arch back playing Test Match cricket? Even if it's just for two Test Matches, jo- Josh Tung, you know, you're, you're looking at kind of a, a group of younger bowlers that just need that, that platform now. And it's not just them playing individually. It's can, can a couple of them find a combination? You know, Broad and Anderson have been with us forever and they've been outstanding. Yeah. Can, can a couple of these younger bowlers just find a combination together? And the only way that you're going to find out is by giving them opportunities in the summer. Because you do bowl as a unit as well. You know, I mean, look at, you know, well, we keep talking about it, Broad and Anderson, Kirtley and Courtney, Wacker and Wazzy. You know what I mean? These guys go together, don't they? And you, and, and you know, yeah. Caddick and Goff. You know, these guys, they feed off each other and they know their strengths and they know how they then create pressure. So, you know, a lot of people think with bowling, it's just running up there and hurling it down at 100 mile an hour and see, you know, trying to knock the fella's head off. But, you know, there is a little bit more to it than that. And they've got to find that sort of bowling unit, which I think is going to be difficult in this day and age with like, schedules and rest and rotation. But they have got to find some sort of like core of, let's say, if, you know, five or six guys who that they can just dip in and dip out. But they all know, you know, I mean, all it, it, I can remember on tours, you know, all the batters used to go off and have a little bit of dinner and all the bowlers used to go off and have a bit of dinner, you know. And you and I know it sounds a little bit, you don't want those sort of clicks developing. And, I'm, you know, they, and they don't really. But the bowlers have got, a, you know, if they, I, I like that sort of bowlers and batters a little bit, you know. I like that that sort of like yeah. there's that group of bowlers. You know you've got your bowlers back. You know that if he's having a bad time, I'm going to step in and bowl you his overs for you. There's a lot of that that sort of goes on. And I think that England are lacking in that a little bit. I think that there's too many sort of like, but but that's the way of the scheduling. One thing that would improve the balance of the side and obviously the balance of the bowling attack is if Ben Stokes can can be bowling regularly. Absolutely. And obviously Absolutely. we saw him coming back and having a bit of a bowl in this test. First ball back, taking a wicket, uh, taking the wicket of a centurion, somebody who was well settled as well. Um, he he's got that X factor, hasn't he? And that that will make a huge difference if he's he's able to bowl. How did you see him going? The knee looked good, didn't it? He, he he's a he's the key to the balance of the side. Um, you know, would England have won the series in India if Bennett had been fit to bowl? I, I don't think so, but they've certainly got a lot closer. Um, you know, as a captain, if you've got that all-rounder that uh, that can give you 15 overs a day, and not just 15 mm. overs from Ben Stokes, you know things are going to happen when he bowls. It's just a, a completely different proposition. That that really was England's problem. They had two all-rounders at five and six. Johnny Bairstow's an all-rounder, you know, batting yeah. at number five, averaging 36 in Test match cricket. He's really a number seven with the way that he's been playing. Um, and obviously, Ben had a, a, a difficult time with the bat, so it kind of stood out even more that he wasn't bowling. But if he's back bowling in the summer, you know, I think it, it probably makes England a 20% better team straight away. Um, my my pro, I just hope England and the management, what what I don't want to see, Ben, is when the county season starts in April, you know, I think there's a six rounds of four-day games leading into that first test match. Young players are, are, are paid to play cricket and the likes of Duckett, Crawley, Pope, they should play every county game. Because as soon as the six games are up, 
you know, then there's a T20 World Cup, so they're not going to be playing a great deal of cricket around then. I just want, you know, I, I love the fact that they have a bit of fun and they go and play a bit of golf. I think for their minds, it's absolutely spot on. But they've got a breather now for the next few weeks. And as soon as county cricket starts, I think it'll be great for the county game if all the England players that are involved in the IPL are just playing every single game. You know, why, why should they rest or why would they want to rest um, around April, May? There'll be a bit of a breather in June and then the test series starts in July. I'm hoping they're not thinking, oh, our next test match isn't until July. And uh, why do they need to play six county matches? Well, I a fact, a lot of these younger players, I think it, it served them really well to actually get back into the county system. Just to, just to almost like remember what it's like to be just a county player. I think it'd be good for their game. I think it'd be good for the, the game in general. Um, so I don't want to see two or three of them missing out. I, I believe Joe Root's going to play five of the six matches. That, that's the whisper that I get, that um, England's greatest across all formats, in my opinion, is going to play five of the six matches leading into uh, that first test in July. Um, so if it's uh, going to be good enough for Joe Root to play five out of six, I'd say the others should be playing six out of six. Just, just Ben, just going back to that uh, Ben Stokes thing about bowling as well. Um, it's it, 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 like Jimmy and, and Brody, you know, were the leaders of that attack, you know. And, and I think mm. everyone needs a leader of an attack. And I think Ben Stokes will be that leader of that England attack, you know. I think Jimmy now, I mean, with all the experience, you, you don't necessarily see him as the leader of the attack, do you? You, you see him as that well, wonderful bowler who's going to bowl you the overs and, you know, and get your wickets and keep it tight. But you don't see him as a sort of a leader of an attack. So Ben Stokes coming back with the ball, not only for the balance of the side, but, but for the bowlers. And you could see that Ben was frustrated not being able to bowl, you know, because he's that bloke, give me the ball. Yeah. He's like a both of, you know, give me the ball, give me the ball. I'll make mm. something happen. I'll do something, you know, and you need those kind of guys just to drive you on during a test match. We've mentioned Jimmy. Uh, we mentioned his 700th wicket. Um, it's obviously extraordinary. And the, it's a lot. The, a lot. The, the, the statistics are so extraordinary that it's hard to sort of pick one out. The, the one that sort of blew my mind was the fact that he was playing in Durham Sala for the first time. It was the 50th, 5-0, 50th ground at which he has played test cricket. <laughs> it's just extraordinary. I mean, if you have, if you have 50 test caps, that, that's, a hell of a, that's a hell of a career. And he's played at 50 different grounds. Where would you know where to sit, you know? <laughs> Uh, I think it was, uh, I think someone put on social media, he's got a wicket in 100, I think it's 113.4 overs, he's got a wicket. <laughs> I think that counts to 700. Uh, oh, it, 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 I, just got, I don't think it's ever going to happen again. I mean, he's just been a, oh, a yeah. cost. Actually, I, I think he looks in himself as trim as I've ever seen him. He looks like a, a he's yeah. like a, a racing dog. <laughs> he looks lean. Yeah. I mean, I saw him. I saw him up the hills in uh, Dharamasala. They, they obviously had climbed the hills, and there's a, a nice water section. He got got his top off, and I saw. Well, jeez, Jimmy, you put some. Uh, you put some. Tri- I think he's on my 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 stay younger juice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell, you something, I tell you something. It won't be through lack of fitness that. Uh, he calls it a day for. I don't think you know this. Uh, you know, no. as you say, he's. He, if anything, he's probably working harder and fitter now. He's getting older because he realizes he has to actually do that little bit more to keep that fit as you get a bit older. So I don't think it's going to be through a lack of fitness or you know not having enough puff to run in and bowl fast for England. I think it's it's just going to be. Um, purely mental with Jimmy. I think you know. They'll, they'll, I think there's going to be a day. When he wakes up and just says, right, that's it, I've had enough. And that's not going to be through fitness. No, no, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be it'll be fit enough to do a job for England. And, he, and he's done a job in India. But, you yeah. know, the, his last 15 wickets um, to 700 took eight test matches. You know, just a, a little yeah. bit of a, you know, Stuart Brawl's last uh, eight test matches, he got 38 wickets. You know, Josh yeah. Tung in two test matches got 10 wickets. So you, you're kind of looking at it and going, yes, he's still doing a job. Um, but how good a job is he doing? And could a younger set of bowlers, they're not going to be as good as Jimmy Anderson. I get that, no chance. <laughs> but somewhere, somehow, England have to move on, you know, and they have to give a, a new generation of, 
of combinations uh, to be created. Um, you know, with the Duke ball in England this summer, phew, Jimmy Anderson, you, you just know, you know, and if he's one of four, fantastic. Yeah. You know, he's one of four and the other three yeah. need to be younger, uh, fresher combinations because I'll keep going back to the age of Jimmy Anderson, 41, Mark Wood, 34, Ollie Robinson, 30. Another two years on it, which will be Australia in a year and a half time, 18 months time. Um, Mark Wood pelting in at 36. Ollie Robinson at 32. Yeah. Jimmy Anderson at 43. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let, let, let's be realistic. I mean, we haven't we haven't done it in Australia the last two times or quite a few times in recent history and, and, and in the history of the game um, with bowlers that I'm talking about when they were a little bit younger. I, I don't think you get yeah. better. Uh, or um, you don't suddenly find an extra yard or two of pace the older you get, and it's pace that England are going to need in Australia. And that, I reckon. I reckon the old Dad's Army quote's going to come out. The old Dad's <laughs> Army headline will come out again. I've had a few of them. Dad's Army turn up on Australian shores. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, what a win they had! What a win they got in New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Quick word about India because they were they were incredible. Every test they seemed to have a different star. Uh, for this one, it was it was Ashwin also playing in his hundredth test um, along with Johnny Bairstow. I'm not sure any we've ever had two players both uh, playing the hundredth test in the same test. He got nine wickets, um, but it was someone different for every test, wasn't it? And just the 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 strength in depth they seem to have. There's sort of an endless supply of talent with a lot of top players not playing and someone else comes in slots in scores a century or gets a ton of wickets yeah i mean they're a class act i mean on, on you know home conditions they they've always been able to earth yeah, younger fresher yeah, new players to play in their own backyard i, I guess the the challenge for the likes of yassi sweet jaya swal and safras khan jarell uh paddy Carl, who played in that uh, last game uh, these younger yeah. players that have come into their own backyard can they do it when the ball's swinging you know, in a year and a, a bit's time, they'll be coming to win. I think that series next summer is going to be a cracker. Uh, England versus India yeah. uh, in, in England. The last tour, um, you know, was dismantled. India were 2-1 up and obviously then disappeared from Old Trafford. They came back the year after. I think it was the year after. Yeah, it was. And uh, they lost that game at Edgebaston. Yeah. The series ended up 2 all. So I think it's going to be a, a crackerjack of a series. Um you know, I, I, I thought the depth is is magnificent in Indian cricket. And I've said I've said it recently. Uh, India don't win enough in terms of what they should win. You know, they've not won a, an ICC yeah. event since 2013. Uh, they've been to a couple of World Test Championship finals and lost, lost to Australia, lost to New Zealand. Um, so they, and I don't, I don't think they've prepared brilliantly for those two finals. I don't think they've got to England quick enough and early enough just to pr- plan and prepare. They've almost just turned up and played, so it's not easy. Uh, I just wonder whether that will change. I think I saw today that for England to re- reach the World Test Championship final, they've got to win 12 out of 12. I think India need to win 5 out of 12, <laughs> and I think Australia need to win 3 out of 9. So it, it's looking hard for it. I'm, yeah. England will say that they can still do it. They always do. <laughs> yeah, they but will, I can't see them winning yeah. uh, 12 out of 12. But you know, when you think the Indian side didn't have Virat, didn't have Rishabh Pant, uh, no Mohamed Shami, Kale Rahul didn't play, Bumrah missed a game. Uh, or two. I, I, I just think uh, what it shows that uh, India in their own backyard have got probably 30, 40 players that they could pick and they're going to give any team a, a real g- a good run for their money. Yeah, uh, and I was impressed with Shubman Gill. We know what a sort of elegant, sort of classy looking player he is, but he looked terribly out of sorts at the start of the series, Mike, didn't he? Yeah. And he, and he, he got them over their line, didn't he? I think in the third or the fourth test match, when it, when they just needed a score, and then last test match, he then sort of like you know went crazy and just said, "Right, you're on the floor. I'm going to pick you apart now." But very impressed with Shubman Gill. I've, I, I, I've always liked the look of him as a player, but I've always thought there again, he's just a little bit susceptible at certain times with a bit of swing and a bit of seam outside that off stump. But he very quickly. That's that, that's the brilliance about a five day se- a five test match series, isn't it? That you can see people learn and sort of take little bits, come in and out of form. And I think that's what England did as well. Actually, England, England. I mean, you're, you're talking about Ollie Pope. You know, scored that fantastic hundred, then didn't get a run, did he? You know, mm. you know, and, and sort of like yeah. they built into their form when we sort of splashed onto it. 
and then was scrabbling around for a bit of form for the last sort of four, three or four test matches. Mm. So I was very impressed with Shubman Gill. Phil, just to, just on that, I mean, I, I'd like to know what happened to Gus Atkinson on this trip because Ollie Robinson yeah. played in the fourth game and clearly he looked short of a gallop, but England had seen him in practice to pick him. He got 58 with a bat, but yeah. with the ball in hand, he looked short of a gallop. I wonder what Gus yeah. Atkinson um, did wrong to not get that selection ahead of Ollie Robinson. You know, so I look at those kind of uh, decisions, at, you know, a bit more pace. I, I kind of look at those scenes and think, oh, do they not fancy Gus Atkinson? I mean, he clearly was, yeah. wasn't was like for that fourth test match when they needed a, a fresh bowler and they went for Ollie Robinson. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to know what's happening with Gus Atkinson because, again, you've taken a young set of, particularly a, a few players that haven't been given a game. There was a couple of A-tour games. Could England have played a, a few in that A A series just to give them some cricket? And Ollie Robinson playing yeah. in that. Uh, Gus Atkinson, a Dan Lawrence, I, well, he did play. Um, could could they have played a few of their backer, you know, the players that they didn't feel was going to be in their kind of top 12 or 13 players just to give them some cricket? Because it's bloody hard on a tour to Indy when you're not playing any cricket at all to then suddenly get yeah. thrown in and said, all right, you're playing a test match. Yeah. I think I, th I think that they played. I think that they played Ollie Robinson because they wanted that sort of uh, they wanted that sort of control. Uh, you know, they, they they wanted a bit of another Jimmy. I reckon. You know what I mean? To just sort of like keep that control. The wicket's going to spin. I'm not sure, but yeah. I mean, Gus Atkinson. You, I mean, I've you know I've I've seen him play. He's got that slippery pace, and he's not. He's not. He don't spray it everywhere either. You know, I mean, he he, he can run up and hit the top. Bold channel as good as anyone, but just a bit quicker than mm -hmm. most. So uh, I think he's going to be the future, um, or he's got a very good chance of being England's future as well. They need someone like that. You know, they haven't had someone like that since perhaps a Joffre Archer. Do you remember when Joffre first came on? Yeah. You know what I mean? He was like, whoa, here we go. You know what I mean? He was that leader of the attack and someone that could, you know, and that wasn't just running in bowling, you know bouncers and all this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? He was a line bowler as just as well, but at 90 odd mile an hour. So yeah, a lot of skill I think there as well. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, a lot of skill. Uh, you're right. I would have looked to play Gus Atkinson in at least one of those test matches. Uh, we're joined now by Nick Holt, the Telegraph's chief cricket correspondent. Hi, Nick. How are you? Uh, they talk about... Uh, they talk about the India tour being a long one for the players. Uh, presumably, it's a long one for you, quick cricket reporters as well. Are you you beginning to flag? Yep, there's about four of us who have been here from the start to the finish without going home or going anywhere else in between. And uh, yeah, time to go, really. Um, got one night in Delhi. We just flew down on a little propeller plane from Dharamshala, which has got to have the most amazing backdrop of any airport I've ever been to. Um, and uh, yeah, landed in Delhi and we've got a night here and then off tomorrow. Um, so give us give us some a feeling of the what's going on with the England camp in reaction to this because this is obviously the the biggest uh, stumble, shall we say, uh, that uh, has happened under the uh, the Stokes McCullum regime. Did you speak to either of those guys? Did you sp speak to Ben and Baz? Um, and how are they how are they taking it? And what are the lessons that they're drawing from a four one series defeat? Yeah, obviously Ben spoke after the game and then we had uh, Brendan, we had to sit down with Brendan, not yesterday, but the day before uh, for quite a long period. And um, yeah, I, it's the first time that we've really heard them admit that things need to improve and change. Um, Baz spoke quite glowingly about some of the names that he wants to bring in in the future, like uh, Gus Atkins is obviously going to get a game. Uh, probably Josh Tung will come back, Matt Potts. He had a good Lions tour. Uh, I think they've probably recognised they should have had him in the squad here. Um, looking at batsman-wise, I don't think there's going to be many changes in the top six. Obviously, Harry Brook will come back. Um, but yeah, I, I think also Baz was, was quite humble as well in that... that um, that they were taught a little bit of a lesson in the last couple of test matches, mm. um, particularly in Ranchi, when they didn't take their chance and they were really crushed uh, by India um, for that mistake. Um, and I think he's admitted that they need to be a little bit more careful with some of the things that they say in press conferences. It's OK saying it in the dressing room and being ultra confident, but sometimes it does come across as arrogance when they probably aren't arrogant. It's just uh, it's just that, that they, they perhaps realise they perhaps need to tone it down a little bit. Duck it in particular, sort of took a bit of blame for all of that, really, a little bit, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. But, um, 
you know, his comments about Jaswal and and the more runs and merrier and things like that. I think it, they 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 just uh, struck the wrong chord at the wrong time for them, and they've recognised that. Yeah, and uh, in terms of the lessons to be learned from the from the cricket, um, is it is it just a ruthlessness um, uh, to take the opportunities when they're presented? Oh, I think they've just got to be a little bit smarter. I, I, I think that preparation is one thing. It's okay for Ben Stokes because he's one of the world's great cricketers to turn up and turn it on, although he didn't. But it, 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 he, you can see why he perhaps thinks he doesn't need warm-up games. But some of the others did. I mean, Ollie Robinson should really have gone off and played for the Lions. I mean, he spent weeks and weeks and yeah. weeks sat on his backside and then played a game and was short of cricket. I mean, it's obvious. Um, so little things like that. I think they're probably realising selection as well. There perhaps needs to be a little bit more ruthless in that, use that word, that that that, that area um, and perhaps yeah. make calls on players um, earlier in the series. So things like that, um, recognising when the time is right to uh, go on the attack. But look, I, I think Joe Root probably showed the example because he did learn from his big mistake in Rajkot um, yes. and changed. And was much better for it, and played brilliantly in the last two tests. The trouble is, the others didn't didn't learn from that. They didn't notice that that was going on. Yeah, um, as we've discussed in the past, you've obviously written the book uh, on baseball, uh, which I've read. It's excellent. Everybody should buy it. Um, how do you think this reputation? Uh, how do you think this series has um, impacted the reputation of baseball as a concept? Uh, well, we, yeah, it depends how they bounce back from this. Um, that yes, I mean it's uh, basketball seemingly is always up for discussion. Um, and actually, Ben used the word for the first time uh, in a, in the post match press really? conference. We never heard him never heard him refer to it before. Um, so they are they are aware of it. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I, I think Baz was cert- Brendan was certainly had a point when he thought that they were a little bit too timid in the last two tests. And he didn't mean that they should have gone out and yeah. slogged the ball in the air and that kind of thing. But it's about that mindset that they talk about, which is what basketball really is. Um, and I think he felt that the Indian bowl has got into their skin a little bit and the players are playing shots they shouldn't normally play. So it has taken a little bit of a, of a, of a battering, but at the same time, they probably forgot a little bit, some of it themselves. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they'll have a... That's interesting. They have six tests at home this summer. They've got to win six nil. They've really got to set the bar high this summer and really try and win every and win and win every game um, and show that they are they have learned and they are making progress and moving forward. Um, so, and, and what are the plans? Yeah. What's the schedule for some of England's leading players between now and the and the Test summer? Well, actually, it's a good county summer for for the supporters because most of them are playing in England. Um, Johnny Bairstow's playing in the IPL, um, but he's about the only one, really, the big test players. So people like Ollie Pope have got to go back to Surrey and score some runs and and, and just really sort of nail down his place. Uh, Harry Brook will be coming back probably for Yorkshire if he doesn't come out to the IPL, which we're, we're sort of waiting on news on that one. Um, so, yeah, Stokes and Wood, you'd think, would play a bit of cricket for Durham. Um, uh, yeah. Joe Root will go back to Yorkshire. So, yeah, there's there's quite a lot to play for, I think, in the start of the county season, particularly for the bowlers, because that's where the changes are going to be. Those young bowlers have really got an opportunity to push themselves forward because the next test match isn't until July. Um, England as a team, uh, not just the test team, and the next big challenge is the World T20 in June. Um, so uh, yeah. well, there's a lot at stake for that. That the management of that team after the shocking World Cup they had just before Christmas. Uh, so, yeah, go down to county cricket. You'll probably see quite a lot of England players this summer. Let's finish on an offbeat note. What were the biggest positives for England from this series in India? Oh, I mean, if you'd have said to me at the, the start of the tour that, you know, England would compete with the spin at times with a, a very inexperienced group of spinners, you know, Shay Bashir, Tom Harley, Rayan Ahmed. Um, Rayan's played a couple of games. Uh, Shay has just been thrown out of seven first class matches on the plane. He finally got his visa sorted. Uh, and Tom Hartley's played yeah. just a few games for Lancashire without pulling up any trees. Well, all those spinners at times bowl beautifully. Uh, and I, I think that's that's the, the real positive of the tour that, uh, in particular, I think, um, Shoei Bashir, he just looks like he's got something quite special. You know, England haven't really had a spinner that's uh, just got a little bit of that natural variation and 
that just that little bit of mystery about him. Um, you know, we've had some really good, high quality, orthodox spinners: Graham Swan, Monty Panasar, the cat himself, Jack Leach, orthodox spinners. But Shoaib just looks like he's just got a little bit of something different, which is a great sign. Two Test matches, two fifers. Um, he's just got to be developed. He's got a bowl in all the different conditions around the world. He looks like he's got a little bit of something with the bat in hand as well, which is good. Mm. Um, Tom Hartley, uh, again, I think he's a, a very consistent orthodox uh, left arm spinner and he did a tremendous job. But I think in Shoei Bashir, um, I think England have something there. Whether he's going to be uh, ripping up trees in England and um, in Australia, we'll have to wait and see. But I, I think in subcontinent conditions, uh, and particularly in wickets like we, we know in July and August when it gets dry in England, the pitches start to spin. Uh, I think he's going to be a major threat uh, for England going forward, which is a, a great sign. And also full credit to the selectors for picking him. They they pulled him out of nowhere and he's done a tremendous job. Yeah. Phil, um, what did you like Bashir? Um, and what is it about how he bowls that impressed you? Yeah, um, I mean... Just for the start off, you know what I mean? If those two guys <laughs> hadn't have bowled as well as they uh, did over there, and they would have sort of had the right not to have a great tour, you know, it happens over there. Crikey, you're right, it could have got messy. So they've, for a start off, showed a lot of character, <laughs> haven't they? You know, they've, uh, they've stood up, you know, in the face of an Indian side and Indian conditions and home advantage and all that and absolutely showed what they were made of. Um, the one thing about Bashir, I think he's got, I think he's got the ability to bowl well on flat pitches as well. You know, as you say, he's got that height. Uh, what I notice is that he's got that nice sort of over-the-top, little skip through in his um, delivery stride, but can pin the batsman in the crease. Um, OK, Jaswal looked to try and use his feet and get down and give him a bit of a slap over the top. But he has that ability to bowl at people in the crease and keep them in the crease without the ball turning. Um, uses uses the crease nicely, uh, mixes his pace nicely. And you could see him actually through the tour just start to play with his bowling a little bit more and start to get a little bit more confident in his bowling and sort of like, oh, I might just toss that little one. I mean, the one that he got uh, Jaswal out when he ran down the wicket and he missed it, I think that was in the last Test match. That was just him sort of feeling confident in his skin instead of just running up there and bowling darts and hitting a pitch, hitting a pitch, hitting a pitch, which he was actually picked to do, which he can do. He then was just sort of like, you know, I think I might just take him a little bit wide, might just bowl that one a little bit slower. But he has that very good base to start from of a nice tall, bowls it at a good pace and can pin a batsman in the crease. That's, that's a great starting point because then all your variations and your skill and your craft as a spin bowler then can come out of you. But he has that, you know, because flat pitches, let's be fair, different kettle of fish bowling spin on. Mm. You've got to be able to hold these batsmen. Mm. You've got to be able to keep them, uh, not just coming down with big bats and making you over the top. And I think he has that ability to do so. Mm. And looking forward to the summer, we've already said what we think England are favourites against the West Indies and Sri Lanka. Is is the danger there that they, you know, they go full basball and they win and that they don't develop as a side? Well, all I'll say is if the West Indies arrive with Shamar Joseph and Jaden Searle and co and, and Kemar Roach, you know, they've got to be wary because if you disrespect any, any attack or think you can just uh, climb into any bowlers in Test Match cricket, you might become unstuck and you know, it, it, even against Seam at times, you look at the way that they play the short stuff against Australia at Laws last year and, and the second innings at Edge Baston, they just kind of forgot the way to play and they allowed the opposition back into the game. And if they completely uh, commit to playing expansively all the time, it, it may just uh, bring the Westerners into the equation. You know, I, I think they, they, yeah. they looked a bit aggressive and they looked to play attacking, but by the back end of the Ashes last year, they played more within themselves, but they actually ended up scoring quicker because they were knocking the ball into the gaps for ones and twos. Um, but there's a, there's a lot to admire about this team, and there's a lot to admire about the way that this management have dealt with the last two years. It's been tremendous to watch, but I, I just hope they are honest with themselves and they're assessing what they've done cleverly, rather than just saying, oh, this is what we're about, and this is the only way that we're going to play. Because if they continue to just play one way, uh, a team like Sri Lanka, a team like the West Indies might just catch them. You never know. So they've they've always got to play smart cricket. You know, smart cricket is the way to win test series. It's the way to win and compete against the better teams. 
Uh, and they've got to get it installed into their brains now that it's got to be smart cricket now, not just expansive and they call it entertaining cricket. And this is our great debate. Is it entertaining watching England? Yes. Um, are we enjoying it? Yes. But would we like to win? Of course. <laughs> We'd like, we'd like to see them win a, win a big series or two. And I think they missed an opportunity in the Ashes. They missed an opportunity in New Zealand. And I don't think, uh, even if they'd have won a, one of the second or third test matches, uh, or should I say third or fourth test, I, I still think that they wouldn't have won this series. India are just too strong yeah. against this England team in their own backyard. But they have missed some opportunities to, to win games by the way that they've played. And I just hope they learn from that. And are there any uh, bolters out there, any players in the in the county championship who might come from nowhere and get involved in the series uh, over the summer? We've obviously had Shoaib Bashir, who's come from sort of seemingly nowhere. Are there any names that you'd like to throw into the hat? Phil, you first. Yeah, I mean, well, just one. I mean, we're talking about bowlers and bowling combinations. I wouldn't mind seeing Matthew Potts back. Um, yeah. I think he's got a lot of talent. Uh, you know, bowls at a good pace, looks to swing it. English conditions, I think he'll create a lot of trouble. Yeah, well, he, he actually had a good time of it in the A Tour in uh, India, so he did well. Yeah. I was amazed that England didn't think about keeping him on the tour actually because he did so well. Um, I, I, after, I, I think they'll. I, I, as I said before, I think Ben Folks has earned the right to get, get given an opportunity at number seven. But if they turn, it'll be either for me an Ollie Robinson from Durham to keep them back at number seven. Or I'll throw a name into you if they want to go young and fresh and give someone a chance who did tremendously well for Somerset last year, James Rue. If they want to go young and they want to go fresh and they want to go for a kid who's got a huge, huge future, um, I I wouldn't be surprised if they turned to someone like James Rue. Yeah, nice, good shout. That's all from us today. Thank you to Mike and thank you, Phil. Thanks also to Nick for calling in from India. And massive thanks to everyone who's downloaded the podcast over the last eight weeks. Your support is hugely appreciated. Next up for England's test side are visits from the West Indies and Sri Lanka this summer, when we'll see what lessons have been learned from this sobering experience in India. Until then, goodbye.